The Higher Side Chats doesn't start with underwear ads or guilt-tripping donation pleas, nor would I ever commit the cardinal sin of podcasting and interrupt the flow mid-show to show you an unrelated sponsor. But the free first hour episodes do have to start with a little PSA before we get into it to ever so quickly remind slash inform listeners both old slash new that you're about to get into what I'm sure is a great first hour of a high level interview, but that means you're missing half the show. If you like what we do around here, get yourself a THC Plus membership and listen to the full two hour interviews as they were really designed to be and as I know you would enjoy them most. Give a little and actually get a little more in return of the thing you're actually engaging with. Five episodes every month, plus forum access, community comments, downloads to all the closing cover songs, a plus show RSS feed to use with any private RSS feed supported app, and the occasional joint session bonus shows, which include the messages you might leave me about your own theories, experiences, or otherworldly encounters at thehiresidechats.com slash voicemail. If you're not quite sure, if you just want to feel us out, or if you're only here for this particular episode, no worries. New first-time subscribers get a seven-day free trial when you sign up at thehiresidechats.com. Cancel anytime. Try it out, because it's so important to feed the things you want to grow and starve the things that gotta go. And with that said, let's get on with it already, huh? In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, people. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and we know by now that in many different areas of life, the capstone cabal has crafted satanic systems, corporate monopolies, and even entire industries to invert them from their very own definition and purpose. Corporate GMO food has the least nutritional value, Big Pharma makes us sicker and creates three problems for everyone they can alleviate, Education has slowly made us dumber for decades, and the justice system remains completely unjust. On top of this, they have actively suppressed real solutions and destroyed the lives of those savvy enough to discover some. And chief among those folks is the late, great Wilhelm Reich. Not only do his orgone accumulator pods get rave reviews for restoring health in those fortunate enough to experience one, but his cloud busters have been demonstrated on video to create rainfall and would be a legitimate solution to drought, relieving areas susceptible to wildfires, and could even re-green the deserts, according to people like today's guest Mitch the Orgone Donor. In fact, Mitch has dialed his passion for Orgone energy and combating the geoengineering agenda up to 11, and is one of the most educated and dedicated people in this space that I know of. He has made and gifted his orgone energy devices to thousands of EMF radiating cell towers, smart meters, and other frequency emitting devices in Chicago, Nebraska, and his current home state of Arizona, and has seen very interesting effects from restoring equilibrium to the atmospheric environment. He has also demonstrated his device's impressive ability to break up chemtrail lines in the sky on multiple occasions on his YouTube channel. He's currently on a mission to restore the rain cycle in the deserts of the American Southwest, and I certainly support that, so let's get into it. The true Johnny Appleseed of Orgone Energy, the tower buster builder and ecological equilibrium restorer, Mitch, welcome to the higher side. Wow, Greg, (laughs) that intro was amazing, and thank you. I don't know how I'm going to top that now, so I'm happy to be here. I absolutely appreciate you giving me an opportunity and a voice to share what we're going to share today. And so, yeah, it's been very exciting here in Arizona and a lot has happened over the last year. Anyone can say that for just about (laughs) anything, but for weather related purposes and, you know, the overall energy here in Arizona, it's been quite a ride to say the least. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Of course, man. This is going to be a good one. I first learned about your work from your Alpha Vedic interview, and I found it really interesting, and I knew it was something that I wanted to highlight here, so thanks for doing the dance with me. 
We have talked about Wilhelm Reich a fair amount from time to time, but I always leave those interviews wondering, well, where are the disciples of Reich today when we need to combat drought and wildfires? And now I know someone who is actively working to do that and bring the work forward. To quote your website, you say, first, let's connect some dots. Did you know there's a connection between cell towers, 5G, smart meters, Wi-Fi, cell phones, Bluetooth, and other EMF devices on the planet? and the sun-blocking haze of lifeless white geoengineered weather manipulation occurring in our skies? Did you know these devices emit weaponized frequencies against humanity to geoengineer the environment, terraform the planet, and control and manipulate the energy of our collective consciousness? Did you know there's already a solution to this problem? There is, and that's called orgone energy. So... Hell of a paragraph, but with that, let's start by having you tell people a bit about the scope of your work and the successes that you've had along the way. Absolutely. You know, I'll kind of dial it back to around 2015 when, you know, I was doing a lot of research on the process of geoengineering and the dirty word people talk about, chemtrails. And it was at one point clicking in my head that, you know, everyone's talking about this thing, but what do you do about it? It was making me really depressed. I mean, like I think it would anybody. And I get a number of messages from people at this point in my journey via, you know, email, phone call, text, whatever, that, you know, it's a very overwhelming concept and that there's nothing you could do about it until I had slipped into this term, this orgone term, and came across this thing called a hockey, I mean, it looked like a hockey puck. And I've made the jokes that, you know, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? And basically around like 2015, early 2016, I set out on this mission to prove this really ridiculous thing wrong. And that was the idea of what people were calling tower busting. And when I say people, you know, people I gravitated to along this journey where there weren't a lot of people to talk about it, but folks that come across most people's radars like Don Croft, George Richel, people like that. And so people who've been gifting, what we call gifting, essentially just meaning that you're putting these devices around somewhere in the world. It happens to be around high intensity EMF locations, things like cell towers, things like power plants. And I was just really dead set on, you know, I, I loathe government. Anyone who reads my website, I mean, I dare you to find somebody who frankly just hates it more than I do. <laughs> um, and I know that's probably a dirty word, but it is what it is for me. And I don't like agendas. I don't want to live in a false reality. I don't like this artificial construct that's been created over us. And so when I set out to do this, you know, it was this you know, self-proclaimed pissing contest to prove it wrong. And I ended up doing the gifting, spreading these things around, starting in what at that time was Chicago. And we were seeing really positive results that were easy to see. You know, something we'll talk about, I think, as we go along in the conversation is when you get started doing this and you get started doing it in an area where maybe there's not a lot of what we would call busted towers. There's not a lot of people doing this you're going to have larger, more noticeable reactions that will eventually start to taper off as you build your energy grid out further and further. Well, in Chicago, which is just high intensity EMF hub, it was very easy to see a lot of these reactions right away. And first and foremost, you know, you start noticing things in the sky. I've been looking at the sky for years knowing something was wrong and it was when i got into this and started busting towers i mean starts with one two three next thing you know on the weekends my counterpart and i going out and busting you know a dozen towers on a saturday night or whatever and over time week after week you know you start to see these things breaking down in the sky we started to see bluer skies and started asking the questions you know how you don't notice something until one day you do kind of like chemtrails I know I didn't always notice them until one day I did, mm -hmm. but you start to notice like, oh, wow, like the sky is the bluest I've seen since I can't even remember. You know, we started testing as far as finding patterns, the directions of what these, I'm air quoting planes when I say this, and 
I'll elaborate on that in the conversation too, but seeing these planes doing certain patterns in the sky based on a number of factors that included things like astrological events. It included new moons and full moons and the cycles with that and how it seemed like, oh, there's something in the sky that is not just trying to control the weather. Because at this point, I think a lot of people, if you knew about chemtrails and you acknowledged their existence, you knew something was up at least to you know a tiny degree. You knew something was up with the weather and the connection to those. Then you start learning about this energy component, learning about consciousness, learning about things like the occult, the esoteric, and you start seeing all these patterns and it's like, well, now, wait a minute. This has to do with far more than just weather modification. It's like, you know, I challenge people, for example, because they'll come back. I mean, they're like, well, what do you mean consciousness? What does this have to do with consciousness? And I tell people, you know, go and pay attention to your sunrises and your sunsets and pay attention to the prime times when you're supposed to be sun gazing. And a lot of us know through different methods and different civilizations, different historical documentation we have access to or things we've picked up on intuitively, we know that there is a benefit that comes with certain prime time sun gazing. Well, you can find patterns in the sky that are strategically obstructing or attempting to obstruct the sun at those prime times. That's just sort of like, like I know before we had hopped on here, we were kind of talking, I mentioned puzzle pieces. Everything about this, even though what I do is what we call tower busting and organite gifting, this is a never ending jigsaw puzzle where you're constantly piecing together all of these different elements and all these different resources and people and projects. And you basically put the puzzle together and you're like, okay, well, the picture on the box says geoengineering, control the weather, end of subject. But it's like the puzzle I'm putting together, it doesn't match the picture that's on that box. And every time I flip over a puzzle piece and figure out a new one, all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's two new ones flipped over that I don't know what to do with yet. So as I got into this in Chicago and started gifting, you know, first we saw clearer skies. I also noticed that, you know, we were notorious for Chicago being a swamp. If you go there in July, it's hot and muggy. But we were noticing decreases in temperature. We were noticing bursts of precipitation. I'm a little more busy now that I'm not documenting literally like every single detail about the weather every single day that used to just consume my life. So I do it a little more sporadically now. But when I started, these patterns we were finding was that, you know, I know you can go out and gift around, say, 20 towers over the course of a week, and you're going to notice different bursts of wind, you know, energy fields that you've unclogged or that have stalled. You're going to notice like when you see what we call DOR, deadly orgone radiation, that's a term that comes from Wilhelm Reich. It is essentially an energy field that is the opposite of orgone or the opposite of what we would consider life energy, but it's that flat, lifeless haze. And I'll elaborate on that too, specific to the fires. I know there's all kinds of talk about fires over the last year, and, and I want to explain too why we did not have a problem with fires here in Arizona, but this smog will react certain ways. I know that when you start chucking these hockey pucks in certain undisclosed locations and you mess up a frequency, say around a place as huge as like, I'm not suggesting going into the airport, by the way, I mean, I want to be clear on this, but when you're going around an area and these things have a range of, you know, roughly a quarter of a mile, and you go around a place like, say, O'Hare International Airport, well, guess what? You're going to start seeing reactions in the sky. You're going to see these bursts, these holes that open up. You're going to see the sun get brighter. You're going to see chemtrails that, you know, I tell people go to my website and look at my, I think it's just on my homepage, actually. The first one you get to, if you scroll down, I have tons of videos there showing how after you gift a number of towers on the ground, there's not the same energy bubble to hold those trails together and to make them plume and spread across the sky like they normally would. And what happens is 
you see this snapping apart. You see something that, honestly, the first time I saw it, and I get pictures from other people now pretty much on a daily basis that are like, what the hell is going on? And it's like, there's no bubble to hold that. And it starts to seize apart. It looks like spaghetti noodles or roller coaster tracks or a DNA helix. And it starts to spiral out of control and they seize and they snap apart. And I've got tons of videos on my website to illustrate that. And it's like some of those videos are actually, I mean, I use those to explain to people who are like, oh, that's just condensation. And I'm like, then tell me what in the world kind of condensation does that. And as time went on and we were gifting more and more of Chicago, Chicago, I mean, we started having some significant impacts on the weather. We were having colder temperatures. We had, I'm going to say it was probably around 2017, we started having these torrential downpours. We were having actually quite a bit of flooding. Where previously, you know, having documented the weather up until that point, I would see storms probably like on a weekly basis that would go over us, they'd go out into Lake Michigan to completely miss us. And then all of a sudden, then they'd start to burst. So of course, the rain is benefiting nobody. It's going to an area that, you know, before it keeps going on to Michigan or up to Canada, it's like nobody was actually benefiting from any of this precipitation. Well, that started to change. We had cooler temperatures, we had record rainfall, and I used to do this thing where I actually, and I challenge other people to do this when you get started busting towers, I would videotape, record every morning my local favorite meteorologist, and I would make notations in the video and I would kind of dub over it and explain how these people cannot follow their scripts accordingly once you start messing with the weather. They stumble over their talking points or what they were saying early in the week, all of a sudden it changes. And you'd see these week-long outlooks that they have on the idiot box where they plaster the phrase, we are your weather authority. And of course, if you watch it and believe them, then you've just consented and made them the authority of your weather. <laughs> and it's very witchcraft, whether they know it or not. But as you start to bust these towers and you take, basically what you're doing is you're deionizing the environment, you're changing the electrical charge of this entire battery that they have completely manipulated through the use of these towers and different EMF sources. And I mean, dirty electricity, essentially, we're just in one giant dirty electrical bubble. And so you remove these elements from that and you can't perform your alchemical witchcraft anymore. Your temperatures start to drop. Things are always more mild. Humidity is gone because what you've done is you've cleared up things like the DOR smog that allows moisture to stick to in the form of humidity. And I think overall, I mean, in Chicago especially, there were people commenting come June that are like, where the hell's summer? Because it was just there's a chill in the air and it didn't have the same level of humidity that it did. When fall came around, there was actually an article in the paper I was reading one day about how foliage had not started turning yellow and red and whatnot. And of course, they try to associate everything to climate change. If it's raining, it's climate change. If it's dry, it's climate change. If it's sunny, it's climate change. And if it's not, it's climate change. If you have a bad Tuesday, they'll tell you it's climate change because that's part of the agenda. But all of these things that were going on, it's like we were seeing a restoration and then comparing our work. When I say we, by the way, I'm referring to just my significant other who is very much under the radar and, and this is sort of my baby. So if you hear me say we, that's who I'm referring to. But anyway, we were seeing all of these reactions and like temperature decreases, cleaner skies. I started noticing that the full moons and the new moon cycles were not being completely chemtrailed over successfully like they had been before. And, you know, once we started incorporating what we call the chem busters, the very tall towers that have the copper pipes that stick up and are based off of Wilhelm Reich's cloud buster, you start putting those things out there in the environment after simultaneously busting these towers. And, you know, I challenge anybody to ignore the elephant in the room when your weather starts changing for the better. People who have flooding, it goes down. People who are in drought, increase in precipitation. And some people have asked me, you know, I get a lot of questions about the chem buster specifically. 
and oh Mitch if I do this is it going to flood here and what I have come to over the years is that a lot of my views from 2015 16 they don't match today I have had to reevaluate things because of the inconsistencies or you know there are certain theories we have based on repetition, based on observation, based on anecdotal evidence. I mean, people are telling me all the time, here's what happened to them, here's what happened to this person from whatever they're doing with this technology. So you start to formulate these opinions. And back then, in the case of, say, the foliage issue, you know, if you read Wilhelm Reich's work about the energy flowing through this realm, and you compare that with putting tower busters around your plants or burying earth pipes in your garden, Organite, orgon devices, concentrating orgon energy has been shown to increase plant production, to increase the yield, and to speed up the growth rate. And I'm jumping all over, but if I, <laughs> I will say if I fast forward to present and what I've been doing over the last year here in Arizona, we had a second spring and has made me reevaluate now, even today, how deep the cycles of the seasons go and has made me reevaluate what really is going on with vegetation on this planet and could there be more to it basically what i'm getting at is i'm not so convinced anymore that there's actually an autumn where things begin to die off because mm -hmm. for us it seemed like we had a spring we had a summer we had a spring and now we have a winter and it's just very interesting to me having created the grid of earth pipes in my project this last year. I mean, we've put 8,000 earth pipes over the state of Arizona in the last 12 months. <laughs> and as time went on, I guess what I'll get at, then I can pass the mic is after doing this in Chicago, you know, and researching Reich and how he came to Arizona, I knew it was something I wanted to do. I knew that the climate hoax, what I call the hoax was going to be pushed just exponentially in the coming years. And sure enough, here it is. And I knew I wanted to go to the Southwest because there's something about this land, whether it's, you know, Arizona, California, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, Idaho, Colorado. I mean, we're seeing even just recently with a fire that took place in Colorado, there are a lot of targets in this side of the country, even though everyone's dealing with geoengineering. But I think that the Southwest and the Western side of the United States has been really heavily terraformed and is a huge component of this climate agenda. And so I just, I knew I wanted to come here and three years in, I've lost track of how many places we've gone, how many tower busters I've made at this point, creating this grid. And we're seeing the benefits. We just had the second wettest monsoon season in history. We had record rain actually just this winter already by the second or third day of winter. And, you know, they're still pushing drought and the whole talk of it, but this stuff shuts off those talking points. Wow, man. Yes, that is a super great overview. You touched <laughs> on a lot of the things I had on my list. I like that you say meteorologists are just actors reading scripts from their handlers at Weather Central. Yeah. I think that we should drill down into blocking solar and lunar cycles. There's some interesting stuff there. But one of the big questions I have is just that, you know, I am... Definitely a believer in orgon energy, and I've seen Trevor James Constable's Cloudbuster demonstration that assured me this is possible to make it rain, but I do struggle with how the little orgone devices that you would make in a muffin tin or the earth pipes that you make that are about the size of something that would fit into a carry-on luggage, all without any moving parts, it's hard for me to understand how they can really disrupt cell phone towers or affect chemtrails way up in the sky from the ground level it seems kind of like throwing a stick or a rock at a tank like it just seems like not enough to disrupt something so epic and large but help me understand the mechanics of what these devices are actually doing and maybe how many you need and how you place them i know that you want to bury them keep them away from areas where people are gonna discover them and disturb them but these you know, details of how a tower is busted. Yeah. So this is actually one of the viewpoints I think I've had to evolve on over the last few years, because if you research different folks who are doing what I'm doing, 
you know, anything I'm saying today is going to be on my website. And so that's definitely the resource where I tell people to go first after this. But of all the people I've learned from, and I'm consuming this from everybody, there are mixed reviews on how a piece of Organite is working. So I'll start with what it's made out of. That's obviously the big one. The components of Organite or what we call an orgone device. I try not to use the word organite specifically just because I think it's a trademarked term now. Mm. Uh, it's a whole other can of worms I talk about on my website as well. But as far as making one of these devices, you have these components of an organic material. In this case, we're using a catalyzing resin. So something like a polyester resin, a laminating resin, some kind of an epoxy, things like that. The other component is some form of particulate metal. Typically, we, we just say metal shavings. Think pencil sharpener shavings or smaller. You mix these two together. So the metal is your inorganic element. You've got this organic and this inorganic element. And then within this matrix of these two components, you are somehow putting crystals into them, quartz crystals specifically. And it doesn't have to be a lot, but like, say, I'm going to use an example, the hockey puck, what we call the tower buster. Those are roughly four ounces. You can make them in a muffin pan. That's the standard, I think, for a lot of people. I don't know how that came to be, but it just is what it is. But, you know, it's roughly about four to four and a half ounces between this mixture. And you want it to be half and half as far as the resin and the metal. Something that size, you can just crush up a little bit of quartz. You can do quartz sand, a couple of small points. Some people take the beads off of a necklace and they might put that in there too. You know, think like a teaspoon or something, just a little tiny bit. That's a general basis of the Tower Buster. From there, it branches outward using different types of metals, different sizes of metals, different types of crystals, and then some. And it goes quite vast. I mean, there are I know here in Sedona, you can't throw a tower buster without hitting someone else selling organite. And there's all kinds so much that we even have the term organot, which is specifically organite that's been made incorrectly. And we can talk about that in a minute too. Mm -hmm. But as far as how this works, this is the part that has been one of the hardest puzzles for me to put together. So jumping into Wilhelm Reich's work, Let's talk about the accumulator box, because this is how I have tried to bridge this gap. The accumulator box, it's about the size of a small refrigerator. A person can put a chair and sit inside of it. And the layers of the box are composed of organic and inorganic elements. So in his case, he's using things like wood, wool, cotton, steel wool. Of course, the steel wool is your metal layer. I know that there were also sheets of copper, sheets of aluminum, sheets of I mean, all kinds of different metals. But basically, the components of it are this layering of organic and inorganic elements because organic elements will absorb life energy. They will attract life energy. We are organic. Anything essentially carbon-based, life. We are attracting this energy. And then there are inorganics that will repel it. And so in the same way that an accumulator box is sort of pushing and pulling this energy as it harnesses to the center of that box where a person would sit, then the effect off of these devices, I'm going off of what I have gathered over the years, is that think about every speck of metal that's weaved through this tower buster and how in between each of those pieces, there is essentially a layer then of resin because it's all mixed together as some kind of sludge. So you get the same idea of this layering effect. And I mean, if you're using something like metal powder in a piece of organite, think about every speck of metal powder encased in some of that resin, but then it's separated from another piece of metal with that resin. So that's a lot of layers. So the idea is that putting this around a tower, for example, which has its own energy field that is more than just EMF. It's We can go into it, maybe we won't, but I know there's more than just the physical EMF that this stuff is essentially a gateway, that this stuff is, a, for lack of a better word, a portal, I think, is what I'm coming around full circle toward. 
but you put these things around that energy field and they're going to absorb that energy field and spit out a new energy field. And I've heard it described several different ways by several different people. I recently learned, unfortunately, that Carol Croft, one of the pioneers of the Organite gifting movement, it was her husband, Don, and her. They were kind of a team, and he passed a few years back from a hang gliding accident. But I just heard that she had passed away, I think, this last July. But one of the things I came across when I first learned about this, they had been gifting these towers since, I think, like the mid-90s. And they knew that there was something going on. They called them New World Order Towers, or they called them Death Towers. I think cell towers are death towers. There's nothing pro-life about them. Really, it's anti-life. It's just an anti-life tower stuck into the earth grid trying to change a frequency. But they had talked about the energy fields coming off of these. And, you know, Carol, I think well, she was a psychic or she basically acknowledged that she had these psychic abilities or gifts and had talked about the energy field coming off of these towers being sort of like a dingy gray, just like a really lifeless, terrible feeling energy. And that after putting things like Organite, which at the time, I don't know if they were calling it that, but putting these things around the towers would flip that energy signature and it would create like a blue hue that sort of resembled kind of like the sky on a bright blue sky day, which that just flipped over more puzzle pieces for me when I came across that because then I thought, okay, well, so what is the sky? What makes it blue? And is there some kind of a barrier or an energy field protecting this realm that they're constantly trying to block because i know my most high vibe days where i'm at my tip top shape is the crystal clear bold bright blue skies and i think most people could say that as opposed to the dingy lifeless gray flat chemtrail the high hell horizon so carol was one of those people who you know learning about putting them within the vicinity of towers changing the frequency I came across the same thing with several different people, folks like George Richel, and I'm spitting out these names because I'm like, the only way you're ever going to make sense of what someone like myself is doing is you have to go and study as much of the puzzle as you can. You can't write a dissertation on this stuff and actually make sense of it. It's just never ending. So, you know, George was one of those people over at Organize Africa who I came across, and he had talked about this too, with what we're doing is we're restructuring the signal that comes off of these things and spitting out a new signal. And there's debate about how many of these things you should put around a tower. My personal view is kill it with fire, or in this case, kill it with water. I'm go big or go home. So when I go gifting, I'm going to do three or four of these hockey pucks around a tower or maybe an earth pipe, which I think in my view is more powerful than the hockey pucks, which is why I've been doing my earth pipe project in Arizona in the first place. But, you know, there are some people who would say you only need one. I strongly disagree just because the technology is getting bigger, stronger, closer to our body. People have probably noticed the EMF agenda has ramped up, obviously, with the 5G stuff. But also, if you just look at your everyday electronics, something as simplistic as the iPhone lost its headphone jack a while back. Well, the reason why was so that they could push the Bluetooth headset, because Bluetooth is just another component of this frequency fence that feeds that same bubble, and they're plugging it in wherever they can, whether you drive a Tesla. Sorry, anybody who drives a Tesla, if it's a microwave on wheels. But like you've got people doing things, buying things that are more intense, closer to the brain, closer to the heart, closer to the soul. And so you have to put quite a few of these things around. But as far as the mechanics of it, you know, I know people look at it and they're like, well, this just looks like, I mean, it's a stationary device. There are no moving parts. Well, you know, it has been discussed that the crystal component, I've heard people saying it's like an oscillator with this energy field. I've heard people say, that it's the crystal that's inside that's actually producing the orgone. You know, we broadcast things into crystals all the time. I have some different elements on my website I've been a little more vocal about in the last year, but we make sucker punches. It's a cloaking device that broadcasts a frequency into a crystal. 
We make harmonizers that broadcast frequencies into the crystals that are inside of the harmonizer. I'm currently launched a new project with power wands. People will come across the power wand, another tool that we blast with a frequency into a crystal. So we know we can transmit and receive through crystals. I mean, they've been doing it with radios and technology and, and the whole idea of you know silicon dioxide in quartz and the fact that Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley. Maybe some people would say it's a stretch, but I think there's a there there and why they call it Silicon Valley and why we have so much, you know, we have crystals in all of our technology. It's like somebody else knows that these things can be used a certain way, programmed a certain way. But so it's been described several different ways over the years. And, you know, for me, the best educated guess I can give is that it has to do with pulling in whatever the field is and spitting out a new one. And so when you do that, multiply it by 100 towers on the ground, you've now created a completely different web that's down here on the ground. And that's why I think, you know, you can have things like birds perching on tops of cell towers after they've been gifted. You can see plants growing faster. You can restructure water using orgone devices too. People are always looking for the physical thing. Mm -hmm. We're programmed that way at this point. Even people who say like, trust the science and then make fun of the people that keep saying now trust the science. Even those people that are on to the fact that most of the modern day science is BS, then they still want, like I get so many messages every day and they want a term paper summarized down into three sentences that will make them completely believe and understand what it is that this stuff is doing. Right. And I would tell them that I take this quote from Wilhelm Reich all the time where he talks about, you know, what is proof and the ability to prove something. You're only ever going to prove something to yourself. And the only thing you can really do is to value an education, the ongoing search for more information to where you are proving something to yourself. He said it in fewer words, but the point being is someone like myself went out trying to prove this wrong and was pleasantly surprised. And the person I learned from had done the same thing. One of my friends who learned from me said she did the same thing. She's like, this guy's batshit. And so it's like the best thing I think a person can do is to take an active role and get out there, make this stuff yourself. I have tons of resources on my website that a person can jump in pretty quickly and go start testing this yourself. There's so much going on and I I have to reel it back and apologize for sounding like I'm kind of, I am going all over the place because so much has changed in such a short amount of time that when I started doing this, it was all about the towers. It was just go bust the towers and call it a day. And now we're learning that like here in Arizona, it was last January when I started my earth pipes across Arizona. I did what the name implies. I put earth pipes across the state of Arizona, and it took a lot of time. It's been basically a full-time, I won't say it's a job because it doesn't pay, but it's a full-time endeavor, meeting new people, connecting with people, traveling around the state. And finding others who can help me to put these things in these locations that I, having mapped out all these different puzzle pieces, am thinking, okay, this needs to go here. This needs to go there. We've got a huge issue right now with water. Even though there was so much flooding in the southern part of the state, they're still pushing drought up towards Lake Mead and the Hoover Dam. And I would tell people, go there, go visit there. and count how many emf towers you see around there and anything else that stands out to you because it's horrific and i know it's all intentional and i know that they're changing the energy signatures of this water they're changing the earth's ability to bring primary water to the surface and you know in burying these earth pipes around the state we've seen water come up from underground similar to how i've heard of water coming up from the ground from people who've built small pyramids. There was a gentleman in Illinois who had built a pyramid. He built a Giza-shaped pyramid for a home and then lined it with gold leaf. And he had a moat come up from underground just like that. 
<laughs> and it's like, well, isn't that interesting? And then we learn about mountains, compare it to mountains, which are just naturally, they're just natural pyramids. Well, a lot of people think that the rivers running down a mountainside are there because of the rain or just the snow. And it's like, no, they're there because the water, it's not as simplistic as just saying osmosis, but something's drawing it to the top because mountains are essentially giant orgone generators and they're pulling primary water up to some source that then will flow down the mountain. And that's something we're seeing now when you start looking at tower placement. Go look at tower placement everywhere you go and start connecting those dots with the geography, ecology, the occult stuff, esoteric stuff, ley lines, energy points, any kind of conspiratorial stuff. Start comparing all of that stuff together. And it becomes, for me anyway, and I think for most people doing this, you start seeing like, oh, that's why they put these towers here. You know, I've got one tower, only one tower in the village where I live which is, thank God, and it's by a fire station. I don't know for certain that they put them on fire stations because of the energetic component. I mean, fire stations are still government entities. Maybe with the fire component, maybe it's carrying a signature. I don't know. But what I do know is that after looking at Google Earth and looking at the formation, I live in the village of Oak Creek. It used to be called Big Park. And when you look at the development and you find, oh, this tower is tapped directly into Oak Creek, even though it's not technically on it, you can see where it goes. And so it's like, okay, well, why is it that I keep coming across all these towers that are tapped into water? Why are they now putting cell towers on every water tower? Why are hydroelectric power plants just riddled with, I mean, there's, we got power plants out in the middle of nowhere and there's towers that they could, you could get reception on the moon. If the moon is a physical thing, I'm not even going there, but uh -huh. it's like, you could, Basically, they can do whatever they want as far as telecommunications, and they clearly don't need to, mm -hmm. you know, and you start comparing that with the forests around here, too. We venture to a lot of middles of nowhere. That's part of this journey, I think, and what it's going to take for people to do, because you venture out into the middle of nowhere and you start finding some real sinister stuff out there as far as these weapons. I call them weapons. And. The deer do not need 5G, so what is this doing out here? And, you know, Arizona is one massive lava tube anyway. I know there's tons of underground stuff, and that's another component too. So the puzzle pieces never end. It's like you're looking at everything, and now today it's like, okay, we're not even just gifting towers. We're gifting water sources. We're gifting these ley lines. We're gifting, specifically in the case of the water, trying to restore the natural flow. If you look at Chicago, you know, they changed the direction of the Chicago River back in like the 1800s. And of course, at the time, they claimed it was to clean up the river or to keep Lake Michigan from being polluted from the stockyards. I mean, it's plausible, but the idea of them changing the Great Lakes and where one of the areas is bleeding out I think that rivers are essentially like veins that are carrying these energy signatures wherever it is that they need to go. And I think that there is some nefarious component of this realm that has changed that energy signature that has tried to manipulate it or to feed off of it. And it's kind of like those substations. Everyone's got substations in their area, their neighborhood, whatever. There's a lot of questionable things about where our electricity comes from, whether it's really being produced in a plant 200 miles away and then coming to us on an extension cord, or is it possible that it's coming directly out of the planet? Because again, you flip over enough puzzle pieces and you're like, what I'm told doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and where I'm going is starting to make more sense or at least seem more plausible. Sure. So that's why I'm saying like people have to just it's a lot of rabbit holes and it's never, ever, ever, ever ending. But hopefully where I come in is I can help speed up the process for somebody and at least they can see, you know, here's what I've done over the years. I try to at least explain how I came to the realization I did or the thought that I did, even if I still don't have the final answer. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. And I've heard you talk about those early 
reactions that you notice, like a sudden drop in temperature. I mean, that's the kind of thing I would be looking for that I would notice because I am not that intuitive. So I do fall into that category of wanting something visual or some kind of sensation. But, you know, this is deep, dense stuff. And a lot of things work in our lives that we can't necessarily explain. There's all kinds of things. We know if we do this, then that happens. But try to break it all down and explain every mechanism. And most people probably can't. Like even your cell phone or how the TV signal gets to you. You know, it does. But just because you can't explain it doesn't mean you don't get results in a lot of these situations. And man, it is tough to decide what is the most interesting thing I have on my outline because clearly we're <laughs> cruising right along. But let me ask you about deserts not being natural. On the website, I have this quote where you write, I moved to Arizona with one ultimate goal in mind to prove that deserts are not natural and drought is artificially created. If that notion boggles your mind, please read Contact with Space by Wilhelm Reich. Deserts and droughts are created by a force that is outside of nature and removed from life. And in our case with Earth, deserts are created through the external force of a parasitic entity or energy, including geoengineering activities orchestrated behind the curtains of governments and the military, occult and esoteric frequency witchcraft, and energy and consciousness manipulation of the human collective, all wrapped up into one evil agenda. Well, that is a great paragraph. And maybe we can talk more about these elements that aren't just harp or cell phone towers sure. or EMF, because obviously this goes back further than a lot of those technologies. And the agenda would go deeper, too, if things like deserts and the landscape are natural. Well, as far as we can remember, for a couple generations, they've been that way. So it's interesting how they got that way. Maybe... Talk to us about that force that Reich spoke about in that quote. What do you think really creates a desert and maybe how can we really regreen it? Yeah. Well, so if you're going to pick a book of his, I would say go with Contact with Space. A lot of it because he talks about the Cloud Buster specifically. You'll hear people like myself use the word parasites. I know I'm not the only one. It's based on this idea that there is something that benefits off of us, off of our collective energy, when we essentially feed it by putting up this armor around our life energy. We stall. We stall our energy. When you're not in the flow of everything, when you're not in your tip-top shape, I mean, you know. You know what's going on, and everything feels out of alignment. Well, that can manifest into all kinds of physical things physical ailments and problems and things like that. Uh, in the case of Reich, two of the biggest things he treated using the accumulator were cancer and infertility. And, you know, again, puzzle pieces. It's like, well, I know right now there are some parasites working to sterilize and inject human beings with something that I'm convinced is really more of an energetic component to change the signature that would flow with nature so using these different pieces it's like he talked about you break down basically you stop that flow of life of us and it's going to start affecting the environment and i don't know if this is the right thing to say but i think of the earth as a living being i mean it is we know it's living it's got its moving parts and ecosystems, but as one collective, it is a living thing. And from a natural standpoint, living things do not commit suicide. They do not kill themselves unless something is out of alignment. And so in the case of a desert and desertification, I don't see it as being a natural process that would occur unless something else was being induced or harnessed onto that living being. I think for the physical mechanics, the best thing, because I'm not a Reich scholar, but I think one of the best things people could do would be to get that book and probably Ether, God, and Devil to talk about some of the more mechanical stuff with the breakdowns of soil and how certain things like... This has opened up a huge thing for me around here in Sedona where 
If you visit Sedona, you probably have seen the spiraling trees that are on places like the airport Mesa, and they're just growing out of the rocks. There's no water, there's no soil, and these trees, they just will not die. In my view, they've been getting better and better each year. And it makes me think about things like petrified wood. It makes me think about the rocks around here. It makes me think about how I've got what looks like a giant tree stump. It's just a mesa, but it looks like a cut along the top, giant tree stump in my neighborhood. It was red when I moved here. It is now covered in trees and green. And so when I look at that and I think about, okay, can things be turned one way and broken down and desertified and then reactivated what i'm getting at is i've actually pondered lately if something can become unpetrified mm. um which i don't know if anyone would agree with me on that <laughs> but i the reason is because what i'm seeing is i'm seeing more vegetation growing on these rocks where it's like almost like the rock is being consumed and again it looks like a giant tree stump and i you know, another puzzle piece is that it was the documentary or movie, I don't know what you would call it, called There Are No Real Forests on Earth. And I'm not saying I have all my skin in the game of believing or not believing what's in some of these things, but it adds more questions to everything else that I'm doing. And so when I think about the Earth Pipe project that I did, we started in the two heaviest EMF places I could find in Arizona, and that was Phoenix and Tucson. And, you know, I had people contacting me talking about these washes they thought were or these creeks that had water in them. And they're like, I've lived here 20 years and like, I've never seen this before. What's going on? And I'm like, well, to me, it's interesting when I compare that with this other energy. It's like, are we creating an energy signature that is pulling primary water back to the surface that is de desertifying whatever is around? whether it's helping to remineralize the soil or break down the rock back into soil. Because if it is de-petrifying, say turning back into wood, and would then break down into a more stable carbon that can be you know, broken down into dirt, basically, and provide that remineralization, you know, that's a possibility too. I know that in contact with space, Reich talked about making grass grow in the desert. And I mean, he did it like out of nowhere. And it's like, well, what is it that's making this grow? So many of these components, and this is where I kind of butt heads a lot with the geoengineer, what I call the chemtrail brigade. The ones that are, they make it very, very physical. It's only physical. And it's typically a particulate aluminum, barium, strontium being sprayed. I have conflicting views about that now than I did years ago because the way that I'm seeing things breaking down, it's like I'm seeing more energetic components of this. It's becoming more of a consciousness-based thing. Those are the pieces of the puzzle that are lining up more often. So it's making me think, okay, you know, basically I come back at those people and I say, you know, we don't know, even though we think we do, we do not know about this reality. We think it's a physical playground. Many of us think it's a physical playground. And that's been the hardest part, again, about like, how do you prove that this works without doing it? Or why would a physical piece of metal and resin do anything? I mean, well, resin's comprised of oil. Oil is the blood force of this planet. I have a friend who's an engineer, worked for Exxon for 30, maybe 35 years. And we joke about the hoax that is the oil hoax, that it's infinite, that it's essentially the earth breaking down kombucha type sludge that flows through the earth. And it is organic and it is full of life force. And there's a reason why resin works the way that it does, because it's comprised of oil and oil will attract that energy signature really, really well. So yeah, I mean, as far as the desertification stuff, I think the best thing you can do is to, you know, grab a couple of his books, but specifically contact with space and start playing with these devices. Because all I'm getting every day that I do something else is another puzzle piece, but I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm seeing things restoring. We had our second spring. The wildlife is abundant now. You can't, I mean, 
for three years here, we could go for a walk. We might not really see anything in the middle of the day. You cannot go for a walk now without seeing all these different animals, the deer, the javelina, the coyotes. We've had bird booms. We had a really, really chaotic butterfly boom. And I thought that was interesting when I was researching about how they migrate and they rely on EMF, just like bumblebees and hummingbirds and all these other things that we've had these really strange occurrences with over the last year. And, you know, you couldn't drive anywhere without your windshield being covered. And it was kind of sad, but funny at the same time. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, well, what is it? What's going on? And, you know, I think, again, I'm hypothesizing or theorizing this, but I'm thinking if we keep changing these energy signatures so that our plants are growing faster, our water's coming to the surface, all these other animals, they're a lot like us relying on, I mean, People tell me all the time, Mitch, I can finally breathe in my house. And I'm not a doctor. This isn't medical advice. But someone who, you know, I get some really tragic phone calls from people asking for help in regards to EMF. And I'm like, well, I can give you my opinion and let's talk and whatever. And they'll decide to get something. And then I hear back from them. And sleep cycles is the number one thing I think that people talk about. Improvements in sleep less tension, less headache, more observant of their surroundings, really, less brain fog. And so then go back to the puzzle piece about the towers. What is it that these towers are doing? We can read the patents about how they're literally tapping into the brain waves. I mean, so there is that. We can see all of the like physical dark demonic stuff. And I think that the next step beyond that is that this pathway, I call it the highway to hell, basically, <laughs> that these things are making a highway, that all of these frequencies, the things we would call parasites, the things that Reich would probably call off-worlders, or what he said, whatever has invaded our earthly existence, travels through these things. Mm -hmm. And so, not to veer too far to the right, but I will say that my personal view on AI, I've had lots of really weird things happen since doing this work they've been getting weirder by the day like anomaly messed up weird where and you can you can google thing or you can do online searches for things like organite and black helicopters that's a common one but you know there's a reason we have tools that like our sucker punch a cloaking device something you keep on your person while you're in the process of gifting or busting towers and so with all of this stuff that's going on, I think that AI is essentially artificial consciousness that has to feed off of something. We are that something. It's transmuting our positive into negative, and we're trying to transmute it back because it's like there's this pro-life or pro-death frequency, and the artificial pro-death is trying to cast a net over this realm in every way that it can. And I think it travels through these frequencies and it travels through these devices, similar to how our consciousness travels through the electrical body that is our physical body. Mm -hmm. That's just, again, like I don't know everything and I can't say that is exactly how it is. But what I'm saying is that's where I'm going based on every observation because I guarantee when you start doing this work, you're going to see so much weird stuff. <laughs> wow, wow. I like it, man. <laughs> and the last thing we should touch on are the things that you do make in the laboratory and the purposes they serve and what you sell on the store. You make, of course, the orgone power wands, the earth pipes, the charging plates, and you even have a home protection pack, which I think people would be interested in, of <laughs> course. They always want to armor up their own homes. People yeah. want a personal solution, of course. And uh, tell us about these things as we're uh, drawn to a close. Sure. So I make a lot of the basic stuff. And like most people, I make tactical stuff that's a little more simplistic. And I make some fancier stuff because everybody likes the latest iPhone model of whatever. You know, it's, people like nice things. People like shiny things. And I understand that. Plus, they're fun to make. But yeah, I have a home pack, which is more than I think a person actually needs for the home. But again, my mantra is go big or go home and kill it with fire. So as the grid expands, I tell people at a minimum, get an earth pipe to bury in your yard so that you can start creating a grid under you. 
and then get some of the smaller devices like the tower busters, the pucks, or pyramid, things like that, put around your house, do some gridding around the dirty electrical box that we all live in. For those who live in congested areas, consider gifting, you know, you're going to find like smart meter clusters. So if you live in certain apartments, you might want to get a few more devices and, you know, make friends with people. Biggest way is make friends with people. You'd be shocked how easy it is to get them to people who live under towers to get them to bury stuff in their yard. We grid everything in the area without even coming in contact with a tower. So there's ways around that. But you can go to my shop. I don't make a lot. People think this is actually my job, and it's actually not. I have a what I do for my matrix participation tokens has nothing to do with Organite, but I have devices in my shop and I will be restocking things as often as I physically can. But at the same time, I also recommend, I have a list of people that I recommend all the time for different things. Because some people are really good at making certain things like a chem buster. They take me forever, so I'm not going to waste my time trying to sell them or I'd only be making them. But I know a guy who does this perfectly or sucker punches or, you know, I'm one of few I've found who's doing earth pipes so far. They're not as common as the things like the tower busters, but I do provide plenty of other sources. I also have a ton of material on how to make it yourself. And I try to make the process as straightforward and fun and funny as I can because I'm aware that this is not always the most lightning topic and sometimes a little humor helps to soften that blow. But yeah, for people that want to get anything, go to the shop or go to one of the ones I recommend. Or if you, people ask me all the time, Mitch, what do you think of this one? And like, I mean, it's not really my place to say, but I do have people message me and say, Mitch, what do you think of this piece I got? And oftentimes I have to tell them like, there's no metal in that. And it's what we would call orgonaut. So people can ask me those questions. I'll be honest, but kind about it. And you know, I tell people all the time, just you can reach out to me. The only thing I'm asking is I get more and more into this. My email inbox is an ocean. So I just ask people to please not do novels. I get so many life stories, which I appreciate their time, but I'm one human being. And I just, it's, I hear you. I'm, I'm busy gifting. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people might forget that I'm not just filling a shop to sell stuff. And that's not my thing. My thing is I'm gifting as much as I can. So I want to set people up however I can and get them stuff into their home or get them with the tools to either buy it or to do it themselves and for any kind of a budget, especially, because I know that's definitely a huge influence. So wherever I can come in and help, that's my role. Right on. Yeah, I, I feel like you really have a lot of integrity and you're definitely committed. And I hope that listeners don't flood your inbox asking for <laughs> free stuff. Let's not do that. Gifting means... <laughs> you know, gifting to the devices, it's a nice way of saying tower busting, but it doesn't mean that you're just the Santa Claus of EMF and you're giving everybody this stuff for free. So let's, uh, let's cool it on that. But of course, there are probably other future projects or events that listeners should be aware of, maybe some links to give them. And uh, let's do that while we still can. Well, you know, for right now, I am revamping a little bit of my website. I had no idea. Honestly, I've listened to people like you for years and I would never have pictured myself in this seat here. Uh -huh. So things are changing and obviously all for the better. So as these things happen, it's like, I really want to make it so that I don't want anyone to hit a brick wall because this is so overwhelming and I still learn new stuff every single day. So my big thing is like, I'm personally kind of stepping back from being as loud on like the social media stuff and going into connect more dots. Cause I've been so busy with gridding the earth pipes this last year and really the power one thing I'm doing now, this is all experimental. And I have right now what, like 20 people compiling notes for me to put together because I'd like to write a book someday, you know, an instruction manual basically on how to make it rain. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of on my, my long-term trajectory as far as any other, I mean, I don't really have any events, I guess, that I can say, but go to my website and definitely, you know, I have a lot of 
different types of interviews, talks, materials, resources that will put together the puzzle and let you speed through what's taken me six very, very confusing years to put everything together. And so, you know, save yourself some time. But did I answer that well enough? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Man, this has been awesome. Really educational and motivational. If even half the people listening decided to take this seriously, it seems like we could have a real impact. So hopefully we successfully lit the fire and people will get more involved because I would love to see what happens at scale with this kind of stuff. So I appreciate your efforts. Thanks for all the work you do and for talking to me today and take care. Thank you so much, Greg. It's absolutely my pleasure. Good stuff, guys. Definitely an interesting topic. And I don't know anyone who's as all in on Orgone as Mitch, besides maybe James DeMeo, but he's very convincing and clearly passionate. I like that he's kind of blunt and has lost his patience with people who don't get it or people in the Orgone community that he considers to be doing it the wrong way. Mitch is a character, and I like characters as much as I like off the radar subject matter like this. It's a perfect storm for the THC tone, and being a little spicy is always added flavor I appreciate. <laughs> I like the organ, orgone, donor wordplay too. But this seems to be pretty powerful stuff. I can't say I've seen it firsthand, except for a very convincing rain-making demonstration from Trevor James Constable in the 90s. I am of the mindset that there are a lot of simple things that have big impacts that have been suppressed and quarantined, and it's usually not about the thing itself as much as it is perception control around people believing that thing works. And this seems to be one of those things. But maybe I just need to take a trip to Arizona or something and have Mitch show me if he's willing. Clearly the Missouri's still in me, I guess. But that has been one of my big questions. We talk about Wilhelm Reich and this material, and usually I'm left thinking, well, where is it today? Who's carrying it forward? Where are the Reich groups that I could maybe join or see a demonstration from? And I found it a little difficult to really penetrate that, but Mitch is clearly out there and very dedicated. I guess we could all verify it for ourselves. It should be just as easy as placing a few devices and feeling an atmospheric shift and then saying, all right, now I know. I mean, another really compelling thing in Mitch's videos is that one where he busts up chemtrail lines. We've all seen plenty of lines behind planes and they're always straight until they fan out or fade away but Mitch shows them looking wavy like a sine wave pretty close to the back of that plane with broken up big gaps. And I've never seen a chemtrail contrail appear that way in the sky. So if he's saying this is the visual evidence of the effects of this energy restoration, who am I to say it isn't? I guess if Arizona sprouts a jungle in the next decade, we'll know who to thank. But when we were done, I mentioned that I wanted to ask him about Reich and his point about UFOs showing up when he'd use a cloudbuster. And Mitch said basically he considers that similar to Agent Smith showing up to investigate who's messing with the Matrix. And 